With a potential launch date for the next flight drawing closer, we're reminded of the importance of testing as Ship 31 experiences an anomaly during cryo testing at the Massey Outpost. Also this week, Ship 29 and Booster 11 are stacked for the first time, demolition continues at the Orbital Tank Farm and Test Stand B, and the next section of SpaceX's second Texas launch tower arrives at Starbase. Now let's dig into this week's update. Starting off this week, shortly after midnight on Friday morning, Ship 30 was lifted off of Test Stand B following its successful static fire two days before. Around the same time, a booster transport stand was relocated from the Sanchez site to the ring yard as SpaceX began preparing for Booster 11's return to the launch pad. Later after the sun rose over Starbase, Ship 29 rolled out of High Bay and parked in front of the building awaiting relocation. About an hour and a half later, the booster transport stand was moved into Mega Bay 1 in preparation of Booster 11's removal from one of the work stands. Then, with the booster stand now out of the way, Ship 29 was rolled through the ring yard area and into Mega Bay 2 for final prep work before its next trip to the launch site. Early that afternoon, back down at the launch site, Ship 30 was disconnected from the two-point lifter, indicating it was now secured to the transport stand. Nearby, not wasting any time, crews moved in on heavy equipment and began demolition of Test Stand B, a clear indication of SpaceX's confidence in their new ship static fire stand at the Massey Outpost. About an hour later, in Mega Bay 1, Booster 11 was lifted off of one of the building's work stands and transferred to the recently arrived transport stand. Around 3 p.m. local time, Ship 30 was rolled across the build site and then out onto Highway 4. The Flight 5 Starship then made its way back up the road to the build site. A few hours later, Booster 11 was moved out of Mega Bay 1. The tolerances through the doorway are tight enough that the rocket's grid fins are rotated while the vehicle exits and then return to their neutral position. A short time later, inside of High Bay, Ship 31 was connected to one of the two-point lifters. The ship thrust simulator was then moved from the Sanchez site to the ring yard. Once preparations were completed, the Starship was then lifted off of its stand, which was then rolled out of the building. With it out of the way now, the thrust simulator was moved inside and the vehicle placed onto it. As Ship 31 was being placed onto the ship thrust simulator, Booster 11 began moving towards the build site gate. Then just after 10 o'clock, the Flight 4 Super Heavy was rolled onto Highway 4 and began its return trip to the launch site. About an hour and a half later, the rocket arrived at the pad and made its way towards the awaiting arms of Mechazilla. Then, as the calendar ticked over to Saturday, Ship 31 was disconnected from the High Bay Bridge Crane and rolled out of the building. The Starship then made its way up Highway 4 to the Massey Outpost for its cryogenic proofing and puck shucking test campaign. Later, as dawn approached, crews were observed continuing with the demolition of Test Stand B as SpaceX works to prepare for construction of the next orbital launch pad. Throughout the morning, a Sikorsky S-64 Sky Crane helicopter was seen lifting new HVAC units onto the roof of the Star Factory. Given the massive footprint of this rocket factory, this is easier than bringing an extremely large crane with the lateral reach needed for this work. Meanwhile, nearby crews were ready to move Ship 30 into High Bay for post-static fire checkouts and additional finishing work. It took just a few tries, but eventually the ship was positioned inside of the building. A few hours later, at the launch site, it was time for Booster 11's return to the launch mount. The Super Heavy was picked up by the chopsticks and rotated over before being placed once again onto the clamp arms. As the lift was wrapping up, the LR-11000 crane began making its way back over towards the orbital tank farm in anticipation of resuming scrapping operations on the vertical commodity tanks. With Booster 11 once again secured to the launch mount, its transport stand was moved across the pad and over to the area formerly occupied by Test Stand A. Over at Test Stand B, demolition crews continue to tear down the infrastructure with heavy equipment pulling down the stand's deck and supporting columns. That evening, the LR-11000 picked up the 12-meter load spreader, which was then connected to the top of the next cryo shell ahead of scrapping. 
Around that same time, the Chopsticks released Booster 11, raised above the rocket, rotated back over and lowered to the base of the tower. As they lowered, the ship quick disconnect arm was swung back in. After midnight on Sunday morning, Ship 29 was rolled out of Mega Bay 2. The Flight 4 Starship was then moved out onto Highway 4 and began its journey to join Booster 11 at the launch site. Once there, the ship moved across the pad and was parked between the chopsticks to await its first lift onto the Super Heavy. Later that morning, crews were seen working with cutting torches on Test Stand B, weakening and cutting the steel so the excavators could continue to pull the stand apart piece by piece. Nearby, a large section of the berm wall that separated the test stand area from its tank farm was toppled as crews continued to prepare the area for the next launch pad. Over at the orbital tank farm, workers began cutting into the cryo shell. Since this tank shell has an exoskeleton, it has to be cut asymmetrically to keep the load balance when it's lifted free. At the orbital pad, Ship 29's flaps were unchained and opened in anticipation of its lift onto the top of Booster 11. Meanwhile, back over at Test Stand B, workers finished weakening the ground support interface structure and the stand's quick disconnect was toppled, falling to the ground with its flex hoses still attached. That evening over at the Massey Outpost, Ship 31 began its first round of cryogenic proof testing. The test seemed to start off like many of the others we've seen. However, about three hours in, something went wrong. A sudden cloud of vapor began pouring out and the ship's raceway lit up with sparks and possibly even flames, as the vehicle experienced some kind of failure. Later, a drone was seen inspecting the damage. Late that night and into Monday morning, crews continued cutting the next cryo shell to be scrapped. Shortly after dawn, with the cutting complete, the first large, balanced piece of the shell was lifted off of its tank. It was then moved to the roadside work area to be cut into smaller pieces of scrap. Around that same time, cutting torches were once again seen on the remains of Test Stand B as crews continued to demolish the structure. Up the road at the build site, workers installed the last few window panes of the feature corner of the Star Factory. With the final sections of cladding not too far behind, this corner of the rocket factory should soon be weather tight. A little further back in the ring yard, concrete trucks were seen backing up and placing concrete in front of Mega Bay 2. Back at the launch site, crews were busy cutting the bottom of the section of the cryo shell that was removed earlier. By late morning, the first big cut was complete and the bottom section of the shell fell to the ground, allowing the rest to be lowered so workers could repeat the process. Later that afternoon, Sentinel Cam caught a booster, likely Booster 14, being relocated inside of Mega Bay 1 onto the right rear work stand. A short time later, crews completed the next cut on the section of the cryo shell, making it another piece shorter as the scrapping pushed forward. Across the launch site, the other demolition crew was also hard at work, continuing to reduce test stand B to scrap. That same afternoon over at the Massey Outpost, the site had finally been safed following the anomaly during Ship 31's test campaign. Crews were seen on lifts assessing the damage. Back at the build site, a new booster forward section was rolled down Highway 4 and into the ring yard. Eventually, the section was staged outside of Mega Bay 1. At the orbital tank farm, yet another cut was completed and the scrap cryo shell continued to shrink. Meanwhile, over by the remains of Test Stand B, crews moved forward with the demolition of the lower half of the berm between the stand and the tank farm. Moving quickly, less than three hours after finishing the previous cut, the cryo shell scrapping crews finished removing yet another section from the bottom of the remnant connected to the crane. That evening, the seventh section of the next launch tower was moved from the port and parked at the intersection of Highway 4 and the Port Connector Road, awaiting the night's closure to move the rest of the way to Starbase. Back at the launch site, SpaceX seemed to be a tad indecisive. Through the night, the chopsticks were first lowered, raised back to the lift points, and then lowered again. Eventually, Ship 29 was moved out from between the chopsticks and parked in the old staging area over near the road towards Test Stand B. The next morning, sparks were once again flying from the remains of the test stand, where crews continued working to get rid of the unneeded hardware. By late morning, the initial round of scrapping on the cryo shell was complete. 
the crane switched out to the tank load spreader, which was then connected to the top of the GSE-2 vertical storage tank. Early that afternoon, another large section of test stand B was removed as the stand continues to slowly disappear. That night, Ship 31 began moving across the Massey outpost and onto Highway 4 for its return trip to the build site following its anomaly earlier in the week. As the ship was starting its journey down Highway 4, the LR-11000 crane lifted the GSE-2 cryotank off of its pedestal and transferred it over to the roadside scrapping area for crews to begin cutting it into pieces. At the build site, one of the smaller telescopic cranes was seen carrying a ring stand into High Bay ahead of the return of Ship 31. Just a short time later, the ship completed its return journey. It turned off of Highway 4 and into the ring yard gate and was then taken into High Bay. Shortly after Ship 31 was moved into High Bay, Tower Section 7 of the Starbase Launch Tower No. 2 arrived from the port and was taken into the Sanchez site. And in the early hours of Wednesday morning, Ship 29 was moved back across the launch site between the chopsticks and staged for a lift. It seems likely that the delay in stacking the Flight 4 vehicles was due to crews wanting to ensure that Ship 29 was safe for testing following the anomaly during testing with Ship 31. Back up at the build site, Ship 31 was connected to the High Bay Bridge Crane via one of the two-point lifters. Meanwhile, the other two-point lifter, as well as some SPMTs, left the launch complex and headed back up the road, likely towards the SPMT yard near the payload processing building. Shortly after 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning, Ship 31 was lifted off the thrust simulator and transferred to the previously delivered ring stand in High Bay. With Ship 31 now removed from the thrust simulator, it was then rolled out of High Bay and taken to the Sanchez site for storage until it's needed again. At the launch site, the ship quick disconnect arm was rotated away from the tower, a clear indication that SpaceX was just about ready to begin lifting operations. About an hour later, Ship 29 was lifted by Mechazilla for the first time. The Starship was eventually set down atop Booster 11, marking the first full stack of the Flight 4 vehicles. Around lunchtime, a concrete pump truck arrived in front of the Star Factory building and was set up to begin work. Around that same time, two additional booster ring sections made their way up Highway 4 to the ring yard. This methane tank section and common dome section made their way to the staging area in front of Mega Bay 1. That afternoon, the demolition of Test Stand B continued to push forward with one of the last columns being toppled. A short time later, the top of another section of the gateway to Mars wall was knocked down as SpaceX works to make room for their growing infrastructure. Then, by late afternoon, the final piece of Test Stand B was knocked down, marking the end of the pad that has seen many tests as well as suborbital flights. That evening, crews were hard at work over in front of the orbital farm, cutting the formal vertical nitrogen tank into small scrappable pieces. Thursday marked a return to testing at the launch site. The road was closed and the pad cleared as SpaceX prepared for the first round of full stack testing for the Flight 4 vehicles. After the tank farm was spooled up and stage zero cooled down and purged, SpaceX performed a partial load of both stages of the flight pair before detanking for the day. That afternoon, as the road was reopened, tanker trucks rolled down Highway 4 to replenish the tank farm following the day's round of full stack testing. As the trucks began lining up to offload, the chopsticks were moved back into position around Ship 29's lifting points. Late that night, the previously staged booster common dome section was rolled into Mega Bay 1 as SpaceX prepares to start stacking operations on yet another vehicle. Then the LR-11000 lifted out the remaining section of the cryo shell, nearing the finish line of the scrapping of another vertical tank. Switching over to Florida, around dawn on Friday, Doug returned to Port Canaveral with both of the fairing halves from the Starlink Group 6-56 mission. A few hours later, Falcon 9 Booster 1069 was lifted off of the dockside stand and laid on to an SPMT for its return to SpaceX refurbishment facilities. An hour after that, a short fall of Gravitas was towed back into port with Booster 1083, following recovery operations from the same mission that Doug returned from just a few hours earlier.
By that afternoon, the Falcon 9 first stage was lifted off of the deck of the drone ship and transferred to the dockside stand for leg stowage operations. Then that evening, since SpaceX's rapid launch cadence doesn't allow much downtime for its marine assets, the drone ship was towed back out to sea for its next mission after less than nine hours at the dock. A few hours later, Doug also headed back out to sea. While it did have a longer stay at Port Canaveral, it still spent less than 16 hours at the dock between missions. On Sunday morning, Bob returned to SpaceX docks after a quick trip to the Bahamas to deliver just read the instructions to the dry dock and free port for maintenance. That night, Falcon 9 Booster 1073 turned the Florida skies back today, launching another 23 Starlink satellites on their way to low Earth orbit for its 15th mission. Tuesday morning, dockside processing was complete on Booster 1083, and it was transferred to an awaiting SPMT for its return to Roberts Road. That afternoon, Doug returned to port with a pair of fairing halves after successful recovery operations for the Starlink launch less than two days earlier. And just four hours later, a short fall of Gravitas followed Doug into port carrying Booster 1083 from that same launch. The next morning, the Falcon 9 booster was lifted off of the drone ship and placed onto the dockside stand for processing. Then, late that night, the drone ship was once again towed out of Port Canaveral ahead of recovery operations on yet another Starlink mission. Less than nine hours later, Doug also departed the port for that same Starlink launch after once again spending less than a day at the dock. And finally for this week, on Thursday morning, the practice Dragon capsule was spotted floating in the waters of Port Canaveral with crews performing regular training exercises. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching, Lab Padre out.